Awesome. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Um, we're just going to kick off because we did start a couple minutes late. My fault, technical difficulties. Um, I'll jump right into intro. So my name is Amber Binway. I'm a product manager with Datadog. Um, I've been with Datadog for about two and a half years. Uh, I focus on cloud security, DevOps, uh, the entire like shift left model with getting security more embedded within de developer best practices. Um, and some other fun facts about me, I snowboard a lot. My background's blurred so you can't see, but I have a ton of snowboards, um, love sailing, cooking, and I'm a Lego fanatic. Um, I find that a lot of people in tech like Legos, so hopefully I'm uh, I'm not you know <laughs> uh, the crazy one here. Anyways, we'll jump in uh, today. My talk is focused about uh, security tool sprawl, uh, which is uh, a huge, huge uh, challenge for a lot of organizations, regardless of uh, organization size. Um, tool sprawl it leads to a lot of things in companies. Um, you know, most importantly and top of mind considering the current landscape. Uh, things like increased costs, uh, decreased productivity, a whole lot of in, uh, context switching when it comes to addressing security inc incidents or just regular audits and um, integration challenges. So we're going to dive in and talk a little bit about what it is, um, you know, how uh, it is, uh, pr you know, introducing challenges to organizations and a bit on how to tackle that. So, you know, before we dive into solutions, I, I just wanted to say, you know, sprawl happens. It's not like a taboo thing. I've been at all sizes of organizations where even with, you know, small budget, small team, uh, very, you know, good process, we sell a tool sprawl. And it's sometimes it's not a bad thing. Sometimes you need to have um, specific tools to do very specific things, especially in the case of security, where when you're looking in modern environments, uh, specific types of services, technologies, uh, parts of your infrastructure, your environment might need to have very uh, tailored tools to be able to provide uh, security visibility into them. Um, you know, in terms of going back to basics, um, you know, sprawl in general, it, it refers to uncontrolled growth. You know, in the case here, um, it means that you might have uh, three of the tools that all ha have very similar overlap. And a lot of this often comes from uh, things like, uh, you know, silo teams buying very similar tools or things like decentralized dec decision making where, you know, there might not be oversight that, behind you know, uh, specific line items or change management, but behind um, introducing new tools to the organization. And you know, like I mentioned, it's not always a bad thing. Sometimes you do need to have intentional tool sprawl or redundant tooling. But in a lot of cases, I work with a lot of organizations that might have five tools that all do the one same thing, and they're not using any of that effectively. So you know, that can lead to a lot of issues. And like I mentioned, there, there are a number of ways that this can happen. So I mentioned um, decentralized decision making, you know, silo teams buying the same things. There's other factors, too, um, that, that come into play here as well. Um, sometimes, and I, I'll make an analogy, but, um, you know, you, you make vendor driven decisions, right? So, um, you're, you work with a vendor that you really like and you're meeting with them on a regular basis. You like the tool and they, they show you a shiny new thing and you're like, all right, I need to have that um, without realizing that you might have something similar in your arsenal that can do either 100% of the job or at least a majority of it. Um, and that goes into FOMO, right? FOMO is a real thing, both in personal life, but also in organizational decisions. So um, FOMO can lead to organizations and, and buyers within organizations to rush. And when I say rush, I mean like they hear that this vendor is doing a shiny new thing or they keep hearing like a buzzword or a specific company come up over and over again and they they just go buy it and they don't do the full assessment um, where they're looking at both like, you know, does this fit in our budget, but also is this really necessary, right? Sometimes just because you can afford it doesn't mean you should buy it, right? 
Um, and then, like I said, going back to the silo decision making, a lot of this go is fed by the latter point. So you rush to adopt a tool, you listen to vendor decision or vendor proposals of, hey, come check this thing out. And then you have folks that maybe make those decisions without having all the right information or the right stakeholders at the table. And so, like I said, it happens and there's a lot of reasons why it happens and it's important to talk about the how. So when you go back to your organization, maybe you can look at those factors where, you know, maybe you're not buying something, but maybe you go and you make proposals for how you can improve those processes. So things like this don't happen in the future. And um, the, the ultimate thing here too is um, it leads to a lot of outcomes. So I'm gonna share a quick graph here. Um, so it's a growing problem. Um, I've been in security for quite some time. I was uh, in DevOps for some years before. And even 10 years ago when I was a DevOps engineer, I had tools for all. I had many security tools, even in my non-security role. Um, and so it's interesting to see that the problem just keeps surmounting, right? It's, it's almost like, a, 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 how do you say it? Like a an almost an avalanche effect. So um, a couple of reports have come out, um, specifically this one, um, this is by Tynes, it's their Voice of SOC Analyst report. It was published in 2022, but it's still pretty relevant because they talked to a lot of SOC analysts and they um, echo this a lot. Um, so when they did their Voice of the SOC Analyst report, they mentioned or saw that most organizations are using over 20 security tools. You can see like that purple highlighted area, it's a very big chunk. Um, and it goes even beyond that. You know, in some cases, um, it goes over 41 and it's a non-negligible amount as well. Uh, there, there have been other reports too that, um, you know, IDG and Rely Quest in another report of um, about 400 IT security leaders that, um, you know, men, that observed that while a lot of organizations talk about strategically approaching cybersecurity and like purchasing decisions. In a lot of cases, it's a game of chance and you can kind of see this reflected in the numbers. So it's a problem. And what does that mean for challenges, right? So uh, it comes with a lot of challenges. So on, on one side, I talked about the processes and uh, scenarios that lead to tools for all. The, these are the outcomes. It's not just a lot of tools. It's a lot of different things. And so, you know, at a high level, I'm not going to cover all of these, but um, the most obvious ones are um, integration issues, right? Um, in a lot of cases, when you're going through security incidents, incidents or audits, it's not just one tool. You're using a number of different tools. You're working with a number of different teams. Um, as organizations implement more and more tools, um, it is, again, a surmounting issue. If you can't integrate two tools really well, when you add three more, it's an even harder problem to solve because um, in some cases, you know, the integrations need to be bi-directional or they need to be uh, uh, smart in the sense of um, knowing, you know, conditional logic or uh, even uh, permissions. So knowing who should have access to those tools and making sure that there is a consistent experience when those tools are integrated with the, each other. Um, and a lot of this complexity in terms of integrating can lead to a lot of context switching. So bad um, tool integration can lead to maybe not looking at the right tool at the right time or looking at the wrong context uh, that can delay things like incident response or, or um, even um, having difficulties communicating what one tool uh, a incident responder group should be looking at um, during um, a security event at an organization. So there's a lot of issues. And you'll see that a lot of these challenges seg segue into each other. So, you know, when you have bad integration, it can lead th to things like resource overhead. So while each tool has its own uh, and, and requires its own resources for deployment, maintenance, and management, when you have numerous tools, especially when they're not integrated well, you put constraints on your staff, on your budget and your infrastructure. And that all outside of the budget side, that all leads to things like using a lot of soft costs in your organization that can lead to things like burnout. In the previous 
uh, report that I showed, the Times uh, Voice of the SOC Analyst report, there is an even more concerning number. I called out that a lot of SOC analysts feel like their job is extremely challenging and they feel like they're facing high months of burnout. And so this resource overhead doesn't help. Um, it also takes resources away from other important initiatives within the organization. You're, spent, um, you're spending time instead managing tools instead of working on greenfield things in, for your company or looking at new technologies. Um, so there's a lot of soft costs there that um, adds to that risk. Um, there's a number of other things. I'm not going to go through all of these, but clearly with more tools means that you need more training. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, security analysts and uh, detection engineers that I work with that tell me that they don't have time to learn a new language. They don't have time to learn a new tool. Um, they don't even have time to even log into that tool. So a lot of that not only, um, you know, wastes money on a tool that people don't even really use within the organization, but it also um, adds to burnout, more context switching, and ultimately oversight. Um, and then, you know, the last two, um, maybe surprising, but maybe not surprising, um, more tools means an increased attack surface, right? Um, and you see this when you're doing security reviews um, for new initiatives within an organization or even security reviews for renewals or new tools that you might be bringing in. Um, that, in a lot of cases, will create more of an attack surface because it means that you, you, know, you have a lack of skilled staff managing a tool, mistakes can happen, um, it creates, you know, a lot of new entry points for attackers. Um, it, it increases the risk of misconfiguration or outdated software or data dependencies tied to the software. And that in turn, ironically, can be exploited. Um, and then the last thing, it can go back to integration, can go back to resource overhead, um, lack of centralized visibility and, and control. So when you can't integrate your tools, when you can't properly train your staff, um, you end up losing visibility and ultimately control, and it can create a huge, huge uh, tipping point uh, for for a lot of uh, companies that are trying to seesaw between different types of uh, tools and different types of processes because of that. So what are the signs? Because now I clearly have scared everyone enough. Um, we will, let's talk about some good solutions here. So some obvious signs, obviously tool sprawl means that you have redundant tools. So um, you might have two hammers, one looks kind of different, but they both kind of do the same thing. Um, it's always good to uh, have things like software catalogs or a list of just the different things that you might use, not even on a daily basis. Um, and, and start to try and do some categorization, or in some cases, I like to say Marie Kondoing all of your, your tools. Um, there's some other things too. Um, under utilization, so um, you in a lot of uh, products, security products specifically, there is a lot of good audit controls, audit logs that you can see how often tools were accessed. You can see this also in your authentication uh, systems. They often keep track, especially for uh, third-party auth type uh, products of who's logging into what, um, and that can give you a very good high-level view as to what is not being utilized, um, and that can help you ask questions like, do we really need this? Um, and the last thing, too, is disjointed workflows, right? So think about the last time you went through a security incident. What was the process? Who got involved? What tools did you use? Um, that can uh, help you identify if there are opportunities to rejoint those workflows. Um, and then um, on to solutioning, right? And assessing the impact. Like I mentioned, if you have a lot of tools, like two hammers kind of look alike or two products look alike, um, it's, it's really good to assess the impact and start building an inventory. So what are the existing security tools you have in place? What functionalities do you serve? Do, do they serve for you or for other teams? And um, what do they cost? That's that's also a really important question. And, and creating an inventory of that, maybe trying to bucket them. Um, there's tons of great resources out there that show you all of the latest buzzwords, all of the latest acronyms and security. Um, trying to map those to, to that 
in an overall inventory list can help you quickly identify, do you have to uh, vulnerability management solutions in place? Or do you have a, plat a security platform solution that can do vulnerability management plus a specific bone management tool too. So taking a look at that and creating an inventory is the first step because otherwise you're going to be trying to find a needle in a haystack um, or you know, you're going to be comparing apples to oranges and, and maybe making not great decisions about removing things, right? That can be almost worse. Um, the other important thing is once you have this inventory, don't go rogue. Don't, don't start talking to vendors and canceling contracts. In a lot of cases, most folks don't have that capability. But uh, the idea is to, to start gathering insights from different stakeholders. Talk to your fellow security team. Talk to IT. Talk to engineering. Talk to your DevOps. Talk to your finance team. Come up with a plan. You know, Talk to your stakeholders. And then get aligned on, hey, is there room for tool consolidation here? Or do we really need these two tools? And what is the reason? Make sure you have justification for what you keep. Um, and and you know, back to the Marie Kondo joke, does it bring you joy? You know, But do that in business terms. Um, and then the last thing is, and this comes after you have the inventory, but it's to measure. Having good measurements are amazing because it can help you bring objective insights to things like tool utilization. Um, and you can derive a lot of that from things like your incident response times. Like I said, how often uh, specific users are logging into specific tools and taking actions. Um, and, and that will ultimately help you continue to iterate and, and continuously evaluate what tools you have instead of doing one big spring cleaning and never coming back to it again. And then th there's also rationalization. So, you know, like I said, you have that inventory, you have that feedback, you have that measurement that allows you to do very good things now. You can continuously evaluate. So you, you can build a framework around whether a tool is necessary and whether it's effective. You can then eliminate, like I said, the goal of this is not to build a long list and to hoard it and not do anything with it. The goal is to remove redundant tools and to continuously do that, right? You know, one tool that might be really popular today might lose its popularity a year or two from now. And there could be many reasons for that. It could mean that the technologies it supports doesn't support your organization's new technologies. So there is a lot of uh, different reasons why you would want to eliminate and continuously do that. And the last thing, too, is you want to consolidate when you can. So um, just because you um, have uh, two things that are very similar, um, you know, it might mean that they might have two, two of your solutions might have two of the same types of features, but maybe one functionality is better. And so it's good to consolidate, but also to document that process of doing that so everyone knows to go to the right place. And my last thing, my last slide, because I know I'm running out of time, is uh, what do you do with what's left, right? Because you know now you've gone through a list, you've consolidated, you no longer have redundancies or you're working through your redundancies. Um, what do you do? And a lot of this goes off of the challenges that I, I highlighted. So um, you, you want to integrate, of course. So you know what's left, so you, you should put the effort to integrate it at that point. Um, what does that look like? Well, you know, first off, it, it goes back to your buying decisions. You, you want to make sure you have tools that have open APIs and good documentations and out-of-the-box integrations. Um, and once you, you've identified that, um, come up with good initiatives that allow you to do that and make sure you have good outcomes and, and measurements for success of that. Um, one good way of doing this is finding things like source. Source can help with that. Um, SIMs are a good solutions here. A lot of security tools, they spit out logs, making sure that those security tools are sending their logs to a specific place. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do that that don't even require you to roll up your sleeves. Um, the second thing is obvious, but you know, as you're, you are building out your inventory, you may have come up with a good set of folks to come up uh, and, and join a cross-functional team. You should have a consistent team. And in a lot of cases, you should uh, try and cycle them out on a regular basis because you want to get new perspective. The idea is have a team that's there and always looking at new tools, always evaluating tools, and has a framework to do so. 
Um, and ultimately, that team can help do things like knowledge share and train and, and improve you know, future collaboration with the greater audience. In a lot of cases, you don't want to have too many voices at the table, but in other cases, those voices can help evangelize within your organization. Um, and the last thing is always iterate. So now that you have this team, now that you have your selected tools, now that you've identified some initiatives to make the tools that you have better and, and, and work more efficiently for your organization, um, you want to take those tools, you want to put them through regular audits, um, you want to make sure that they can scale to your organizational needs, and you want to continuously make sure that you're pushing training and awareness initiatives so that those tools are used um, and that people stay happy with them. Um, so my closing thoughts. Security tool sprawl is a challenge. A lot of organizations deal with this, but uh, it, it can be fixed. It can be managed with the right process. It's, but it's not just about process, it's about the people there. So having the right people that can you know, stay uh, interested, always wanna learn about new technology, wanna ask the right questions, can help manage that. Because like I said, it's not just process, it's also culture. And the last thing is by having the right framework, um, you can very effectively streamline your security arsenal. And so that involves things like um, having a good assessment framework, um, being able to work across multiple teams and being able to roll up your sleeves and, and do the hard work to get things integrated so that you can have a happier future um, down the line. Um, so that's all I have. Uh, I wanted to thank you and uh, give you some contact contact info. Uh, my my email is just amber at data.hq. I'm always happy to talk and answer questions. You can find me on LinkedIn and sometimes I post on X.